Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the full series of live events of the MITx Micromasters in Supply Chain Management. I'm Miguel Rodríguez Garcia, a research scientist at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics here in Boston. I'm the course lead for SEYX Supply Chain Fundamentals, as a lot of you guys know. So first of all, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. This is super exciting. And this is the first live event of the fall series for the, our MicroMasters. And as you know, this is a series of cross-course live events uh, where we invite industry speakers to share their knowledge about supply chain management with all of you. We do these events between <coughs> two of our courses. Uh, in this case, SE1X Supply Chain Fundamentals and SE3X Supply Chain Dynamics, which are both currently running and open uh, for verification. So that's why I'm really happy to be co-hosting the event today with my colleague, Jeff Baker, course lead for SE3X. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hey, Miguel. I'm doing well, thanks. Thank you for the introduction. Hey, everyone. It's great to be here with you all. And we're really excited to share some great insights about risk for resilience uh, at this live event. So today, what we're going to do is follow this agenda. First, our speaker is going to give us a presentation that'll last around 25 minutes. After that, there'll be some time at the end, probably around 15 minutes, where she'll answer questions from the audience. So what we'd like you to guys do, so we want this to be really interactive. We'd love you to use the Q&A feature in Zoom. So that's the one probably a little bit more to your left. Do not use the chat box, use the Q&A feature. Uh, from there, Miguel and I will take the questions and channel as many as we can to our speaker. Uh, before we get to our guest speaker, we want to share something with you all, right, Miguel? Yeah, that's right, Jeff. So we just want to remind everyone that verification for both courses, SE1X and SE3X, is still open. Uh, we'll be posting the verification uh, links on the chat right now. And remember that these two courses are part of the MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management by MIT. And verification is really important for us because it's, first of all, the only way you can actually support us. Uh, and so we can keep this uh, content free for a lot of people uh, around the world, but also is the only chance that you guys have to get a certificate from MIT upon successful comp uh, competition. Uh, so if you like the content, uh, please verify so you can uh, we can keep doing this for you guys. And without further ado, let me introduce our guest speaker. Uh, today, we are honored to have a former student of mine here at MIT, Mel Melanie. Uh, Mel worked for more than five years in supply chain risk management software, uh, but decided at some point that she wanted to go one step further. So she started her MIT journey the same way a lot of you guys are doing. So she enrolled in the MicroMasters and completed her MIT MicroMasters in SEM in 2021. After that, she came to MIT, uh, which is when we met, and she graduated from the MIT SEM program in 2023. Currently, she works at a major aerospace company and supplier management, and she's a mother since not too long ago, actually. So congrats on that, Mel. And welcome back to MIT. Thank you so much for being here. How are you? Thanks, Miguel. I am doing great, thanks. How are you doing? Great, great. Super excited to, to have you. Awesome. All righty. I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. All right. Does that look good? Yep. Looks great. Right. Cool. Um, let me just minimize the cameras here. Okay. Awesome. So today I'm going to talk uh, about supply chain risk and the real world. Uh, so as McGill mentioned, I started my career in supply chain risk management software uh, since I have been in industry um, for a little bit now. Um, so I've kind of seen the realities of what supply chain risk really looks like. So I'll talk about both sides today. So start with the theory and then we'll go into kind of what really happens. Um, so McGill mentioned I am a graduate of the MicroMasters program in 2021, uh, and then I went on to get my full master's on campus uh, in 2023. Uh, and I just quick plug here: I have not, I cannot say enough good things about the program. Uh, the MicroMasters is really the jumping off point and learned where I learned a lot of the um, concepts that I needed to complete my full master's. So uh, I definitely would not be where I am today without those. Uh, without the MicroMasters certificate and then the full masters as well. All right, already having trouble changing slides here. It's a good start. All right, so let's dive in a little bit. So what is supply chain risk management? Um, so really it's the practice of monitoring your supply chain. Uh, and that's often at a high level. Um, I also took this definition from risk methods. So supply chain risk management 
is an intentional process to identify, monitor, and reduce internal and external risk to your supply chain. So what are the key points here? What is internal risk? What does that mean? So these are risks that are inherent to your supply chain by its design. So that could be things like single source suppliers uh, within your supply chain um, or critical parts and materials where few sources exist. Uh, sub-tier suppliers, I cannot put enough emphasis on sub-tier suppliers and how much risk there is within the sub-tiers. Often this is such a black box for companies. Uh, and they say 85% of disruptions come from within those sub-tier suppliers. So besides them being unknown, uh, there's definitely other risks within the sub-tiers. So these can be things like diamond risks, when your tier one suppliers use the same sub-tier suppliers, or just overlapping sub-tiers elsewhere within the supply chain. Uh, maybe that tier three sub-tier is the same as uh, a different sub-tier. Besides that, there's also external risks. So these are this is event susceptibility for your suppliers. Um, and these are things like uh, supplier locations being susceptible to extreme weather. So if a supplier has a manufacturing location, uh, say in Florida in the US, uh, which is very susceptible to hurricanes during hurricane season, uh, natural disasters like earthquakes um, impacting your suppliers. Acts of God are random events. So these are things like uh, explosions at factories that can happen seemingly randomly. Uh, labor disputes. Um, so labor disputes is absolutely a big issue at your suppliers. So, um, you know, things like we've all seen the news about Boeing right now with the contract negotiations, you know, Boeing is forced to shut down uh, production for a little bit. And then political instability, your suppliers. So um, are there uh, riots related to political events within the country um, that your supplier is based in? So in thinking about the intentional part of that definition for supply chain risk, what does a risk program look like? So it involves proactively looking at your supply chain and identifying where those vulnerabilities lie ahead of time. And this has to happen on a regular interval. Um, so be it annually, um, or more frequently, maybe evaluating your uh, key suppliers more frequently than annually, maybe quarterly. Um, importantly, a, uh, a, a effective SCRM program would include people from different parts of the business, different functional areas, so they can fully evaluate the supply chain. So that includes uh, supply chain, manufacturing, quality, uh, logistics, finance, Including all of those stakeholders can help you um, actually identify the business at risk within your supply chain. And then running scenarios, um, looking at the impact of different events uh, on your supply chain. So what happens if there's a, uh, a tsunami within a particular region that knocks out a certain subset of suppliers? Uh, and looking at what the criticality of those suppliers are to your supply chain, to your business. And then similarly, looking at the business at risk. So what are the dollars and cents behind uh, the criticality there? And how much would the company lose if a particular event happens? And lastly, thinking about the total time to recover. So how long would it take us to get back online? And one thing to think about when you're looking at um, a particular event, a particular scenario is the likelihood consequences detectability matrix. Um, so I took this from uh, Yossi Sheffi's book, uh, Power of Resilience. Uh, I highly recommend that book. Um, I definitely used it in preparing for this talk. There's a lot of good information about uh, risk and resilience that's uh, fairly updated. Um, so for a particular event, you're looking at the likelihood versus consequences from your supply chain, but you also need to consider the detectability lead time. Um, so how long would we have to react to this event and to prepare within our supply chain? Because sometimes uh, events are, you know, you can foresee them or sometimes they're instantaneous and that matters when you're applying, when you're preparing for a particular event. Uh, so a quick poll here. Does your company have a formalized supply chain risk program? I'm always interested to see. 
So go ahead and I, get, I give you a couple of answers to use there. Yeah, everybody is already voting. We have almost 100 people who already voted. <laughs> So Excellent. I'll display the results in, in a second. Let's give it a uh, just some more time for people to vote. And we'll Sounds be ready. That's good. Let's, all right. Let me end the poll here. Done. Can you guys see the results? Okay. All right. Yeah, that's interesting. So the most common response is no. Um, which I guess is not that surprising because companies that have really robust supply chains often don't have a formalized risk program. Um, and then kind of is the second response, which is also not that surprising. You know, a lot of companies manage risk to some extent, uh, but it's not really formalized. So thanks everyone for participating. All right, so let's look at an example of a very robust response to disaster. Um, so we'll look at this example from Intel today. So in 2011, uh, a lot of you might be familiar with this event, but the largest earthquake ever measured in Japan's history, uh, which was a nine on the Richter scale hit Japan. Uh, the earthquake triggered a tsunami uh, and together they destroyed 1.2 million buildings and killed tens of thousands. Uh, in addition, there is major damage to Japan's power grid, um, and Intel uh, had a significant office and manufacturing footprint in Japan. So first, of course, Intel uh, local uh, stabilized the local situation, so they made sure all their Japanese employees were okay uh, and set up a temporary workspace for them as well. So what was the impact uh, of this event for Intel? Um, so overall, to ensure get that business continuity uh, with their suppliers, it took six months, um, which when you're thinking about the scale of this kind of event um, is not that surprising. But I think when you're thinking about the scale of um, actually getting your operations back online, that does seem like a lot of time. Uh, so what they found was that their tier ones barely had any issues. Um, so on the surface, everything looked OK. Um, but then Intel pushed the suppliers to reach out to their own suppliers. Uh, and in the end, they found that in their third and fourth tiers, they had um, 60 suppliers that had major issues. Uh, and many of those suppliers were critical and sole sourced specialty chip component manufacturers. They also found that 75% of their assembly and test materials were at risk that were manufactured in Japan. And also the silicon creation process was significantly disrupted. So I didn't know this, um, but the process to create silicone involves uh, crystallization in giant vats. Uh, so some of you uh, on the phone might know this, but this was new to me. Uh, and if those vats are disrupted, say by the tremors of an earthquake, uh, then the silicone is no good. Um, so it was there, that was a major issue for them. Uh, they also had their semiconductor manufacturing equipment damaged and were having power shortages to their factories. So what actions did they take uh, to deal with this situation? Um, so they relied on their pre-qualified suppliers. Uh, and if they didn't have pre-qualified suppliers, they expedited qualification of other alternative suppliers and parts. Uh, they called their suppliers to secure any existing inventory. Uh, they've reduced the material required to each manufacturing step. So I thought that was uh, very smart that ahead of time, they had pre-qualified diluted materials to be used at uh, in the manufacturing process so they could do uh, the same manufacturing with less material. And they also work collaboratively with Japan uh, and the other chip suppliers in Japan. Um, so they actually worked with the Japanese Ministry of the Economy uh, to expedite the repair of the facilities involved in making the components for computers, so uh, leg chips. So it was actually outside of what Intel does as well. They realized that the PC makers needed the all other components as well, not just the chips. Um, nobody would be buying chips uh, without the rest of the uh, without the rest of the products nobody will be buying laptops so it actually benefited everyone to collectively bargain um, 
to help restore the whole industry. Okay, so Intel responded well as Tsunami had a very robust risk program, uh, but how can technology help us do this today? So this is an image from risk methods. Um, so risk, me risk methods is a supply chain risk management uh, company. So this is an image of their tool. And this is just a mock-up of someone's supply chain here. Um, but what, what you can see is uh, you have the entire supply chain mapped out here all of your suppliers and manufacturing locations. Uh, the color pertains to the risk score associated with these companies and their manufacturing locations. And you also have the relationship uh, between the suppliers mapped out here. So what are the benefits of using a tool like this? So you have the quick identification. Um, so you can quickly understand if critical suppliers or parts are impacted by an event. Uh, and what kind of business impact this could have, um, which of your suppliers and which of their factories might be impacted by this event. Can you be the first one to reach out to them to secure any available inventory if you know that they're being impacted? It also gives you visibility into the sub tiers. So um, I know this is a hot topic, but the, really just the act of mapping your supply chain uh, gives you visibility and then so you can monitor the sub tiers as well uh, and you can understand the full impact on your supply chain of an event so like intel did with the third and fourth suppliers but you can see that quickly for yourself and not have to go through your tier ones you can also identify some of those dependencies that we talked about at the beginning so like the diamond risks um, and the overlapping sub tiers so you can see if there's any kinds of those risks inherent to your supply chain and there's also the added lead time. Um, so besides being able to reach out first to your suppliers, you can also get early warning to events like financial trouble. Uh, so bankruptcies typically don't happen for suppliers out of nowhere. Uh, companies often have issues like struggling to make payroll or the inability to pay suppliers and executive shakeups before they actually declare bankruptcy. So it gives you time to prepare and alter your sources for the part if it's necessary. Now there's definitely drawbacks to a system like this, right? No piece of technology is perfect. Um, and one of the drawbacks that I see is that this is all done on a really high level, being able to monitor your supply chain like this and your suppliers and their manufacturing locations. So to this point, to my knowledge, no one has been able to incorporate real-time shipment information into such a platform. Now, there are absolutely companies that do real-time shipment monitoring, will tell you if there's an issue. However, combining the high-level risk versus kind of the low-level nitty-gritty risk of seeing, okay, where is the shipment actually going? Um, as you can see here, there are lines between suppliers, but those are mostly resembling um, relationships. So you can know the general flow of parts, <clears throat> but you're not actually seeing uh, <clears throat> where that shipment is at a given moment. So when thinking about technology, we can't help but think about AI these, these days. Everything seems to have an AI layer these days which is a very useful tool. But so software platforms uh, like risk methods, which is actually now uh, Sphera, I should mention. So it's a tool owned by Sphera, uh, as well as Rizalink have been using AI for almost a decade. Um, so they use AI to find information related to risk events um, to your suppliers. So what they do is they take your suppliers and they find risk-related information uh, when those suppliers are mentioned publicly be it in the New York Times or the local newspaper online. So AI increases relevancy of information. So it takes in huge sets of unstructured data, uh, and in some case, over 100 different languages, and only alerts users to events that may actually impact the viability of their suppliers. So Resilink, for example, um, 
begin using this AI web crawling uh, with natural language processing models. Um, and then in 2023, they actually moved to large language models uh, to be able to include sentiment uh, when news stories come out about their suppliers or their customers' suppliers. So I found this article that I linked here. Um, so I'm sure you could Google it quickly. Um, and Resilink gives a lot of good information about how they're actually doing this and how their models are structured. Um, so if you're a nerd about AI like I am, uh, I would recommend reading a little bit more about Resilink and how they're using AI. They have a whole series about it, so you can get pretty deep there. Uh, and one thing that they do that I found really interesting is they can also apply predictive models now uh, to your POs and predict which one of your future POs will be delayed by, uh, based on current risk events. So I found that really interesting and a really great application of AI. Uh, so what's the next step in application of AI and risk management? Um, so auto mapping your supplier relationships and supply chain into the end tiers. So how they do this now generally is they take public information and they sort through that unstructured data to find information about known relationships uh, between suppliers and they map out a probable supply chain for you. So this is you know automatic and inexpensive to implement, which is great. Um, but it can create a lot of noise if you're receiving alerts on just probable suppliers. Um, and this may require a lot of uh, manual work anyways, because you're still having to confirm it with your suppliers. So in my opinion, there's still a lot of work to be done in this particular area of using AI to auto map your supply chain. So I think it's still uh, a little bit uh, of an open area here. All right, so we talked about risk management at a high level, both manually and with technology, uh, but what happens in the real world? Uh, so I think everyone has their own perspective here about what happens in their corner of supply chain. Um, but Miguel mentioned, I work at an aerospace company, um, so I have kind of a specific view into what risk means for me and in my daily life. Um, so I split the risk that I see into three different categories here, complexity, capacity, and technical. So in a supply chain where parts are highly engineered and highly specific to your product, um, you know, that can add a lot of risk here. Every plane uh, contains 4 million parts. So getting those parts in on time, in good condition, with good quality and installed in the correct sequence um, is really difficult. <laughs> that, you're just saying it out loud uh, makes it seem like a small miracle uh, every time a plane walks uh, goes out the door. Um, skew reduction, uh, which is you know a typical de-risking strategy for companies, not really available here um, when you need all of those parts. Uh, suppliers are difficult to manage for risk in this situation. Uh, so this is something that I severely underestimated coming into a role like this, but um, suppliers can support different programs uh, or completely different types of parts under one company umbrella uh, or supply thousands and thousands of part numbers. Um, so you can monitor the company for risk, but being able to figure out when an event happens, which of your parts are actually impacted uh, and where they're manufactured, um, is extremely difficult. There's also a lot of internal complexity uh, at a company of this size. Um, so there are many, many people working with one supplier and with one set of parts, especially when parts are engineered. So there's a lot of technical resources that still own those parts. Um, so there's a huge loss of knowledge between individuals who are managing these individual parts and systems. There's also many, many critical parts. Um, a plane can't fly or be tested for flight um, without a lot of parts. So it's not just the obvious ones. You know, it's not just the, the fuselage and the, uh, the wings kind of, and the engines, the really obvious things that you would think of that actually enable a plane to fly. 
And they also can't test a plane without um, a toilet and all of the parts that come within the toilet. You know, how many times have you had a uh, flight delay because a seemingly random part of the plane is broken, like the AC system? Um, or uh, a different part of the laboratory or um, you know, part of the galley. Uh, so there are many, many critical parts for a plane. So next, uh, capacity. Capacity is largely based on people, if you really get down to it, uh, particularly for small suppliers. Yes, there's automation, absolutely. Um, but if a machine breaks down, you have to have someone who has that knowledge um, to be able to fix it. So even if you know the machine is highly automated, that also increases the skill level of the person needing to fix that machine. Um, when thinking about small suppliers, I once had a supplier so small that they had a fire and they announced it on Facebook. I don't, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> I don't monitor Facebook regularly, but that's how they decided to announce the fire that they had at their location here. Um, and many small suppliers have processes that are still done by hand, sometimes uh, frequently intentionally. You know, that's how they do their processes um, very carefully. Um, and I once had a situation, a small supplier uh, that had a highly specialized painter die. Um, and they didn't have redundancy for that painter. So those parts were delayed by six months. Uh, and when you think about it, you know, Intel's whole response to the Japan uh, tsunami lasted six months. And this is just one person that highly, that really impacted this supplier. And in this kind of situation, you know, all parts are critical. Um, there's also the office shutdowns uh, during the summer. So, you know, there's the summer holidays, uh, suppliers can't respond to immediate quality issues or changes in demand that come up as well. And there's, of course, cultural working differences uh, and cultural communication differences. Um, you know, one thing in a language might not mean the other, same thing in the other language. Um, so that is absolutely has been difficult to manage. And lastly, there's a the technical risk. So the parts are highly specific to the product. And by the product, I mean the plane. So like I mentioned before, they're very specifically engineered for that plane. So not many, there are not many suppliers that can supply a particular part. Um, and the lead time for design, tooling design, production are often over a year. Um, the engineering process itself contains a lot of risk. So resources get constrained, uh, parts get delayed. Um, there's many different engineering tests that plane parts need to pass. Um, and failures can result in delays for sure. And then lead time for these parts in normal production can be very long as well. Uh, quality issues, quality issues can uh, come up a lot because of complex sub-assemblies uh, with long bomb lists. Um, and lastly, thinking about installation of these parts. Uh, installing parts in a plane is also difficult. Um, and then uh, even when it's uh, the highly specialized, say paint, on the part, um, how do you clean those parts and how do you successfully clean those parts so you don't strip off that paint? So there's a lot to think about here. And I call this death by a thousand cuts because uh, these things seem small, but they can really impact the risk within your supply chain every day. Uh, so quick poll here. Um, how many supplier issues have you personally experienced in the past year? I think I gave some multiple choice for this. I think if we had all the time in the world, I'd love to hear everyone's uh, funny supplier stories, especially for small suppliers. But uh, unfortunately, you know, we have to uh, end this at some point. I imagine everyone has to get back to their jobs. <laughs> yeah, people are voting already. So excellent. Yeah, let's get let's get those numbers up. Yeah, and we'll share it in a few seconds. So, guys, if you can go and, and choose. In the, in the screen and vote, that would be awesome. We have already more than 100 responses, so we're doing Amazing. <laughs> yeah, let's give it a couple of seconds so people can finish voting. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me share the results. So. All right. 
So most frequently, okay, one to 10, 11 to 25. Okay. So not too bad, but you know, 10% of you did say 50 plus, <laughs> which, you know, we're only like three quarters of the way through the year. So that is a lot of disruptions and uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's great data. Thanks for, uh, thanks for responding to that. And um, everyone who's had only one to 10 disruptions, I, I hope your year continues uh, in the same way here. All right, so what are, uh, before we wrap up here, what are some real strategies for risk mitigation that takes into account um, the real world, our real world experiences, and also um, the technology available out there? So pre-qualification of facilities, you know, it seems obvious and uh, it's something that happens during most standard supplier qualifications like, you know, factory walks, tooling qualification, uh, production readiness assessments uh, with technical resources. Uh, but also involving a risk assessment in those early stages. So looking at things like geographic risk of that supplier, or political risk, and also working directly with that supplier to ensure disaster and event preparedness. Uh, and then constantly reevaluating that supplier for production readiness, uh, probably annually uh, traveling on site with those technical, technical resources uh, to make sure that supplier is continuously staffed. Um, but also thinking about did that supplier, you know, move production to a particular part of the world um, that is less stable and that might have some political instability. So uh, being able to continuously requalify that supplier for risk. Um, and then, of course, active monitoring with technology. I definitely talked about some shortcomings uh, of the technology, but uh, there's absolutely value in monitoring your supply chain like that. So there has to be just a balance between uh, using that information you get from technology and your boots on the ground information. Uh, control towers. So we could talk all day about control towers. Um, I'm sure there are some experts on the phone, um, but it's absolutely a great way to look at, say, internal signals. Uh, for example, if your supplier has multiple late POs, it could signal a production issue for a particular part. Um, but you need to have the other information as well to layer on top of that. And then um, lastly, but probably most importantly, is just having open lines of communication with your suppliers. So thinking about things like demand changes, uh, monitoring safety stock, inventory levels, um, keeping tabs on events that are happening for your supplier, or any ongoing issue remediation with them. All right. So that is all I have today, Miguel. Thank you so much, Mel. No, yeah. that was great. Uh, and we have uh, a lot of questions from uh, the audience. You guys can keep que uh, asking questions in the Q&A feature and we'll be channeling them to to Mel uh, on the fly. So um, actually, I want to answer one um, first myself, because one of our learners, uh, Maxi Diesler, um, was asking if MIT actually considered the idea of having a specific course for supply chain risk management. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> we we don't have it yet. I mean, we uh, we do teach actually uh, risk management. We're a little bit uh, feeding SC3X with you, Jeff. Uh, if I remember correctly, but it's true that we don't have yet a specific course, uh, online course, only in uh, supply chain risk management. But um, yeah, we, we'll keep it in mind. <laughs> now going into uh, like other questions for uh, for Mel. So we have a couple of people from the audience um, relating to the tier two and tier three suppliers in terms of, for example, how actually uh, hard can be to convince these guys to uh, get into uh, you know a risk management program to convince them because sometimes when you uh, your tier one tier two probably uh, you're very important to them but for a tier three or whatever you may be a, a very small percentage uh, of their business and um, so I don't know uh, Mel your take on uh, how to get to those uh, in a way that you convince them to actually uh, monitor <laughs> the supply chain. Yeah, it's difficult for sure. Um... I think this has been an issue for risk management companies is how you actually get your tier one suppliers to monitor them. And like you said, it can be a really small part of their business. Um, I think there's definitely something to offering them those tier three suppliers, like a carrot. Um, 
I know one thing that risk methods did was they set up a platform where those suppliers, if they uh, would, would work with your tier one and put their information into the platform, they would also get the monitoring for free. So they would get this benefit of being able to monitor their own supply chains while the tier one and also you, uh, the customer, would get information on those sub tiers. So yeah, it's definitely difficult to convince your tier ones and those and the smaller suppliers, you know, they don't always want to participate in these programs. Um, to you know, reveal themselves uh, and help you map your own supply chain. But I think there's something to be said for just providing them benefit as well. And maybe they get like, you know, a preferred relationship, like a preferred bidder status or something for the tier one. Um, so definitely offering a, a carrot, I think is helpful. Makes sense. Awesome. Jeff, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, yeah, sure. So a lot of questions on implementation. So I think uh, you hit a hot button about the software yeah. packages being able to uh, <laughs> uh, to monitor. And so there's some questions on risk, you know, risk methods or any other oh, software sure. that we're using. Um, how much pre work is required to to feed the company with the data? Um, sounds great, but how much work is involved, and you know, how much effort does it stay to to? Yeah, yeah, yeah I will say it's absolutely varied. Um, you know, I can speak about, say, risk methods and Resilink. I don't work for either of them at this point. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, solution like risk methods, um, the benefit of risk methods is that it's easy to implement because all they need is a list of your suppliers. Um, and then you can add in as much information as you want. Of course, the more information, the better. So you got to have kind of a clean list of suppliers. So that, of course, takes some effort. Um, and then you can add in like manufacturing locations and sub tiers. So, you know, the trade off with that is you're only getting so much information about kind of that high level risk that we talked about. A solution like Resilink, uh, I know they can get down to the bomb list, um, mm. but, you know, and they monitor the risk for individual parts. Um, but obviously, that's, you know, a lot more work. Um, to be able to provide them that information um, and they can hook up to systems like, uh, you know, your ERP. Um, but, you know, the implementation for that is much more difficult for sure. So there's a trade-off um, between how much monitoring you're getting uh, and how much uh, effort it takes to implement for sure. Um, I will say that some of our risk methods customers um, we're up and running very quickly just because of it is much lighter to implement than other systems. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. So we have um, a couple of questions from different people in the audience uh, regarding um, uh, metrics. You know, how did you actually measure the, for example, the supply chain risk level or the, the resilience uh, of a supply chain? So I don't know, Mel, if you yeah. can share a little bit of uh, for example, what you use now in your daily uh, operations or just some ideas of how to measure this in, in a better way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the best way to talk about this would be um, how risk methods does it. So, you know, this is starting to turn into an ad for risk methods, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is my experience. But, um, and I know other companies do this manually as well, um, is that they have a risk score. Um, with say uh, like a risk, they use like a risk score card uh, that contains different areas. So, um, you know, maybe like a delivery uh, risk area and they score um, a bunch of different metrics for risk and then they combine all that to create one overall risk score. So how that company does that is of course up to them. Uh, you know, a company like Risk Methods does have like a pre-built and predefined risk score card that they use um, that they have, I think, I forget how many risk, call them risk indicators. Um, so I don't know what the current number is, but you know, maybe close to a hundred if I had to guess. Um, and each of those individual ones has their own risk score depending on what the current situation is. And then you can average them or you can weight them differently to create one overall risk metric. Um, and like I said, you know, there's you can also do that manually, but that sounds like a, a lot of upkeep. Um, so yeah, I think those are the options. 
So that that's actually super interesting because going back also to what you shared at the beginning of the presentation in terms of uh, you know Josie's uh, um, like graph when you have the probability of something happening yeah. but also the the impact now. And sure. when I think about supply chains, because we are also doing a lot of research now at MIT in supply chain risk management, and there are certain black swan events that we know that can be catastrophic. So yeah. I, I, I'm i also sometimes a little bit skeptic of like the risk scorecards alone by themselves, because yeah. everything gets diluted somehow. But then you know that there might be three or four things, for example, now cyber attacks in, in certain areas, like if we get hit and the ERP of the company uh, is involved in that um, attack or whatever, we shut down operations completely. So we know that's a, like a no-go. So, okay, this cannot happen. If right. not, we're out of business maybe. So it's interesting to see also uh, like, you know, th those black strong events or th catastrophic, uh, catastrophic events that we do need to be completely ready for them uh, versus other maybe risks that we, we know there might be a smaller and there might have a smaller impacts and we can put them all together in, in a basket and, and yeah. uh, create maybe a different type of risk management for, for each of them. But but yeah, different perspectives, different ideas, super uh, interesting world to, to discuss. <laughs> so yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I'll add that it's, you know, really difficult to also quantify kind of that yeah. daily risk as <laughs> exactly. well, you yeah, know? Yeah how do you numbers, yeah. yeah how do you incorporate like oh the painter died or like maybe someone will die <laughs> and yeah. impact the operations of the supplier so you know i don't Perfect. necessarily have the answer around that but it's worth thinking about yeah, yeah. so all right so, yeah yeah so here here's an interesting one so a, a couple uh, different questions centering around geopolitics and i, I think mm. for those of us in the u.s with an upcoming election we're really curious as what's what's going to happen because, uh, yeah, tr trade tariffs, uh, anything like that can really, really impact a supply chain. We've, we've learned that. Uh, so the question is, how do, you, how do you approach the analyzing the geopolitics? Um, it's going to make the supply chain disruptions a lot more frequent. So how do you manage like all the suppliers um, when that geopolitics is in play? Yeah. Um... It's a tough question. Um, there are bureaus out there that score, say, a country for their political stability or instability. Um, and so you can use that information. So, um, you know, I believe the CIA has their own scores of countries, and uh, these are public data feeds uh, that you can use and incorporate uh, when you're looking at your suppliers. So uh, it's, a, it's important to stay objective. Um, because so many of these geopolitical events are also, you know, highly, um, what do I want to say? They're, they're politicized um, and, you know, everybody has their own opinion and sees uh, different events uh, incurring different levels of risk based on, you know, which side of a particular conflict you're on. Uh, so I would say it's important to stay objective and use the pre-existing information out there to incorporate into your supply chain. Yeah, somebody just link the uh, the CIA um, the world fact book. So that's yeah, that's exactly the kind of data source um, that I would recommend sticking to. That, that was one of our CTAs. Thank you for <laughs> oh, great. Uh, yeah, our community you. teaching assistance. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's true. I mean, at the end of the day, well, yeah, in terms of geopolitics, we got into a whole different conversation that maybe <laughs> the, there should yep. be another space for that. But but trying to stay objective, uh, like at work and from a supply chain uh, risk perspective is definitely key for that. We have a lot of questions and we know we don't have a lot of time because we want to be really respectful with Mel and also with the audience. So I'm going to, um, I think we are going to pick just one uh, final question, uh, each of us, uh, if that's okay, Jeff. So mine is from Ahmed uh, Alhitari and uh, the question of this uh, person is actually super interesting. Like, okay, we saw uh, when you did the first poll, Mel, that a lot of the people here actually, their companies will have a, um established risk management program. So this person is actually asking, how do you start one? Like, what what do you think are the first, you know, uh, <laughs> milestones when when going into this world? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. I think just being able to go down your list of suppliers and starting to think about well, 
where the suppliers are based is a really good start. And thinking about, okay, this supplier is based in country X and this, uh, you know, they have these manufacturing locations um, that can help you start mapping out the supply chain. And once you, I think once you create that visual map, even if it's on, you know, paper, um, it's, it'll help you start to visualize your sub tiers, visualize and get more visibility that way. So I think just going down the list and just mapping geographic locations is absolutely a, a good start. And I think it'll start the thought process for risk management. Absolutely. And you'll just get, just by that very act, get some <laughs> visibility into your supply chain. Yeah, fully agree. Uh, it's definitely one of the first steps always and will give you information about risk management in terms of geographics also, like if you have concentration in certain areas. And different. also, I would add to that, that probably going through a very, you know, specialized suppliers that uh, we don't have an alternative for in terms yeah. of suppliers that provide uh, mm -hmm. that components that are hard to find uh, and those are also going to be very important to to go through so probably those two things are things that you guys are going to start uh, doing if you are getting into risk management okay Jeff. okay final question i think this is a good one so you provided us a bunch of great information and i know at the beginning poll a lot of people didn't have like risk management and so you know the question is if a company doesn't have a risk management program what's your advice and the first thing to do to start a risk management program Did we just answer that? I would say so. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so uh, all right. So uh, another one I've got. Yeah. Then. Different one. Um, and so if you if you look at um, you know risk, we often think of risk as something bad happening. What if something really good happens? Are is does risk management also consider upsides of um, higher increased demand? And how would you include that in your risk management program? That's an interesting point. Um, I guess I typically don't think about risk as good things happening. Um, you know, risk management in a lot of ways is almost like insurance. Um, you just need to kind of keep building it um, in case something bad happens. And um, so, yeah, something good happening. Um, yeah, I guess like there's risk in change, right? You said like a change in demand, change. like that's, yeah, that that's kind of an unknown. Um, so in that case, it's not like a bad unknown. It's maybe yeah. a good unknown. Um, so I would say like a, a change in demand, you know, that's something that you can keep track of in like a control tower, uh, for example. And I think you can incorporate um, that into your supply chain by, you know, looking at those internal signals um, and taking that into consideration through that control tower. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a great point is thinking about maybe maybe reframing some of this a little bit. Yeah, defining the the scope of risk management is <laughs> is always really really hard. It's definitely yeah. a question that hasn't been answered yet, because you can consider the way you look at uh, disruptions may be very different. Also between industries, a lot of the research that we do here at MIT, for example, like, uh, we can tell you guys that depending on the company that we talk uh, with their perspective of risk is totally different. Like, because for, I don't know, for fashion, if we get a, like our, um, I don't know, uh, shoes delayed for one day, it's not the end of the world. At the end of the day, they might not perceive that as a, an important risk. If you're in pharma or another um, sensitive kind of like industry, one day is critical because someone might be waiting for your product and their life, uh, like it's on the line. So yeah, definitely the defining that scope of, how we see uh, a risk uh, is going to define how we actually deploy our risk management strategy. So for sure. Yeah, great question there. Okay, so I think with this, it's 10.50. We're going to be super respectful. So uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Mel. Thank you so much, everybody who decided Thanks, to join everyone. us today. Yeah, it's been a super insightful session, I think, in supply uh, chain risk management. Uh, I think we have touched this uh, topic a few times uh, already in the last couple of years, but uh, people always uh, bring great questions. So we'll probably deep dive more into it. 
Um, before we say goodbye, just a couple of things. Um, this was the first live event of the fall series, as I said at the beginning. So we are going to have another upcoming uh, webinar in October. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We are going to talk more about AI and digital twins in that um, webinar. So super exciting. And also something important to consider is that SC1X and SC3X are still uh, open for verification. Actually, for SC1X, uh, verification is closing tomorrow. So remember, guys, if you want to support the program, uh, if you want to uh, also get the MIT, MIT certificate, go and verify for, for our courses so we can keep doing this. Again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Mel, Jeff, any final words? Yeah, I'll just jump in real quick. And thanks for everyone for attending. You know, we appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. Uh, please continue to engage with us on our live events, uh, social media, and in the discussion forum. So hope everyone has a great week. But thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you for the opportunity, Miguel and Jeff. It was great. Yeah, of course. Always great to, to have some MIT alumni coming back to the program. It's, it's a bless. So remember, we'll be posting this on, on YouTube, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.